Hi everyone, so in this video I wanted to discuss a certain similarity that I recently noticed between two particular distinct physical systems. So the two systems I'm going to be focusing on are this one on the left, which is just a spring with two different masses, uh, one connected to each end of the spring, and secondly, uh, the system on the right, which is just two different resistors connected to each other uh, in parallel. So I'll start by saying a few words about each system individually, and then we'll get onto this uh, connection between them that I was talking about earlier. So let's start by talking about the mass spring system. And what I'd like to say about this is that we can compare the double mass spring system that we've got here with masses M1 and M2 with another system uh, where we just have a single mass at one end of a spring. I'm going to call that new mass mu here. Uh, and in this other system that we're comparing it to, the left end of the spring is just fixed in place. Maybe it's attached to a, a wall or something. Now, the interesting thing is you can define, or I guess if you define your new mass mu according to the relationship, one over mu is equal to one over m1 plus one over m2, then you find that these two spring systems behave in similar ways. In particular, they will oscillate with the same characteristic frequency. So the, the mass mu defined according to this equation is called the reduced mass. I'm not going to give a rigorous demonstration or derivation of where that comes from in this video, though I have done that in a previous video if you're interested. But for now, I just want to point out that it's interesting to note that you can come up with a single mass on a spring, which is sort of in a sense equivalent to the double mass system, as long as you define the overall you know, sort of the effective mass of mu in this way where you add the reciprocals of the original masses. Now let's shift our attention over to the combination of resistors in parallel that we have on the right hand side. So what you can do with this is define again a sort of equivalent system which just has a single resistor. Um, let's call that single resistor R. Uh, if you choose R in such a way that the reciprocal 1 over R uh, is equal to 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2, then your single resistor will behave in an electrically identical way to the original combination of resistors in parallel. In other words, if you were to put the single resistor R into a circuit, it would behave the same way as the, you know, the overall original combination of resistors. So you'll notice that the reduced mass equation over there and the effective resistance equation have very similar forms in that uh, they take the form of reciprocal of some overall quantity is the sum of, sum of the reciprocals of some individual quantities. So when I was thinking about these two equations recently, I wanted to see if I could find a way of explaining in brief why uh, those two equations have such a similar form. So in order to, to explain this, let's first go through the derivation of the resistance equation, because I think that's something that's maybe more, more widely known. The way that uh, you can derive it is by considering currents. So you have some overall current I going into your combination of resistors. Uh, that's going to then split up into currents I1 and I2 going through the individual resistors. Um, and that current I over here, because that's the overall current, that would be the same as the current that's going through our effective overall resistor R down there. Right now, by conservation of charge, you can say that the overall current I is just equal to the sum of the currents I1 and I2. And here is where you can just apply Ohm's law. So if we say the voltage across um, resistor R1 is V1, the voltage across uh, R2 is V2, the voltage across B, uh, sorry, the voltage across R is just V, then because V equals IR, you can rewrite your current equation as V over R equals V1 over R1 plus V2 over R2. Now uh, we have to remember how potential differences work in uh, parallel circuits, right? So if you connect a bunch of components in parallel, they will all have the same potential difference across them regardless of their resistances. So I'm going to say, but, well, V1 is equal to V2 because R1 and R2 are in parallel, but that is just the same as the, the overall voltage that we would have across the effective resistor R, right? So V1 is equal to V2, which in turn is the same as just the overall voltage V. And then your result directly follows from that, right? Because you can cancel that V and that V1 and that V2 and just get ones on your numerators. 
So that's a fairly standard derivation, but can we do something equivalent for the mass spring system? Well, it turns out that you can, and I'm going to draw an extra little sketch down here. So, um, or maybe I can draw it over here. So you have your little spring um, like this. So consider, firstly, the case where the system is in equilibrium, right? So your double mass spring system is in equilibrium. Um, here's your, your M1 and your, your M2. So then you're going to displace both of the masses by some amount. So let's say you move M2 by some displacement, let's call it X2 over to the right, and then you displace the mass M1 by some displacement X1 over to the left. So it's ended up over there. Okay. Now we can combine those little displacements into an overall displacement, which I'm just going to call X. Um, and it's just, X is just going to be the sum of the individual displacements, right? The overall extension of the spring is just going to be the sum of those individual little displacements. And they're added together because I've defined them to be going in opposite directions. So this, in a certain sense, looks a little bit like this current equation over on the right, where you have an overall quantity being equal to the sum of two sort of partial quantities. However, because we're trying to make a link to the, uh, the masses of the objects on the spring, we are going to have to differentiate this equation twice, right? The reason we have to differentiate it twice is because then we get accelerations, right? X double dot is second time derivative of a distance or a length, and therefore that's an acceleration. And you need to do that because there is a link between masses and accelerations, which is Newton's second law, right? F equals MA. So let's apply Newton's second law to that equation um, that we've just differentiated twice. Now, the this x double dot term, remember that is the second derivative of the overall extension of the spring. So here's where you can you can think about the second diagram of the single mass on a spring system, right? Let's just write the force on that spring or the force on the on the mass as f, uh, and that overall effective mass is what I call mu there. So using Newton's second law, I can write the left-hand side as F over mu. Now, what we could do is also apply Newton's second law to the right-hand side. I could write F1 over M1 plus F2 over M2, where F1 and F2 are the forces acting on mass 1 and mass 2, respectively. So this is, again, sort of it corresponds to that equation that we had on the right with the v over r terms being equal to each other. In the circuit case, we were able to cancel the v's. Can we do something equivalent with the forces? Well, we can thanks to Newton's third law, which says that the forces on uh, objects one and two are equal in magnitude. They're opposite direction, but they're equal in magnitude. So um, we can say that F1 is equal to F2. And those two forces in turn are just equal to the overall force F, right? Because um, the force produced by a spring or the force on a spring um, is just its spring constant times its extension. And the extension of the spring is the same in either case, right? The extension of the, the spring is, is just X. And so the force on object one is the same as the force on object two by Newton's third law. Um, and that has just got to be the same as the overall force acting on our effective mass mu uh, because of the fact that the force only depends on how much the spring has been extended by. So similarly, we can cancel our Fs uh, from that equation, get ones there, um, and then our result for the reduced mass follows immediately from that. So anyway, I thought it was quite interesting that you can just take all of these standard ideas from circuit theory, come up with the equivalent equations for this mechanical system, um, and then develop this intuitive, nice intuitive understanding of why the reduced mass is defined in the way that it is.